Thanks for checking in uh, to our latest conversation. We're three black Brat grads and we're talking photography. My name is Kenneth Nelson. I'm here with my very good friends, Mark Skinner and Greg Cleghorn. We're all graduates of the Fine Art Photography Program at Pratt Institute in Brooklyn, USA, New York. Uh, the three of us have been working, or in humble terms, practicing in the field of photography for more than three decades each. We've worn many photographic hats during that time. We've matured physically and photographically. We've moved from one place to another. Uh, we've met people and lost people we've loved and admired. We've had our family dynamics change and has had many others had their family dynamics change. We've witnessed many man-made and natural disasters, yet we're still alive on planet Earth. As humans, I believe Thank that growth, <laughs> as humans, I believe that growth is a major part of our existence. Mark, Greg, as photographers, would you say that photographic learning is a never-ending process? Oh, I'd say assuredly. Nah. <laughs> okay. I think by now, if we don't know what we're doing, we, we ain't got it, though. Okay, okay. With, with, with that agreement from Mark, and with that so-so... All right, I agree. <laughs> Twist in my arm, all right. Okay, okay. okay. So with that um, learning process in mind, um, I've challenged ourselves to pick one image from each of the last three complete decades, uh, 1999, I'm sorry, 1990 to 1999, 2000 to 2009, and 2010 to 2019, and have it represent a glimpse of the photographic growth factors that happened to us in those years. So in presentation, I will go first and I'll sort of talk about um, the the, the three decades that have uh, just passed. Give me just a second and I will begin timing myself because we've allocated ourselves 10 minutes each for this conversation. So my sort of learning process begins, or at least in the 1990s, um, with medium format photography. And um, before the 1990s, I really wasn't into it and I didn't get my first camera, uh, uh, medium format camera until the early 1990s, maybe even the mid 1990s. And the first camera I got was a heavy one. And it, what it did was it allowed me to photograph larger format, but it also slowed me down from the previous 35 millimeter frames that I've been using. And so what that did was it allowed me to slow down, stop, contemplate, think about the photographs that I'm taking, be more methodical in what I'm photographing. It uh, might have been the snow that slowed you down. <laughs> yes, the snow. Did the you snow think of photographing in the summer? <laughs> Actually, yes, I had. Um, the camera itself was the main motivating factor as to the way I shoot. Um, in this particular instance, because it was a heavy camera, um, weighed a good four and a half pounds, maybe even five pounds, right? And it was a medium format large camera. So. But I yet I challenged myself to go out and photograph as much as I can. And what I began photographing, what I was photographing during those periods in time when I was carrying that camera was still lifes or things that didn't move too much. Things that I can stand and contemplate like anyone would on a large format camera. They were probably frozen. <laughs> well, Greg, I photographed with that camera for the span of maybe a year, that particular camera. So this particular image represents that what I would call the slow period or the period in which the contemplative period. Uh, when I would take this camera out and I would just sit and, well, not sit, but go out and photograph and not uh, just think about what I was photographing, framing more, contemplating, not being impulsive with the images because the camera had 10 exposures. And when in those periods in time, it wasn't really doing too well financially. So if I went out, I went out with two rolls of film and that meant I had 20 shots. So I had to be very meticulous about the images I was shooting. So I was more content contemplative about it. And so what I would do is I would go out and of course photograph still lives, right? So then in the 2010s, Wow, okay. Forgive me. That's... Maybe your cursor's frozen. <laughs> My what? Your cursor. Yeah, I think. He wants that's... you to curse. Yeah, page down. 
I'm sorry. Let me stop sharing the screen for a second. Mm. Stop the clock. No, can't stop the clock. I will continue to go and do that anyway. I'm feeling a little cold. <laughs> well, I didn't realize that this was going to happen. Uh, okay. All right. I'll have to do it this way then. Give me a sec. Okay. Uh, okay. Mm -mm -mm. And I'll speak to the second part. So in the 2010s, one of the major points in my life was I started to contemplate how I wanted to do photographic work. And in that period of time, in the early 2000s, I started to really conceive and think about storytelling and storytelling in a series of images. And one of the first storytelling series that I actually involved myself with was called Harlem Nocturnal. And it came about because I was um, walking around Harlem and it, basically I was walking around Harlem in the daytime and the nighttime as well. But what I realized was that there was crowds of people, tour buses at the daytime, but there was nothing happening at night. After the sun went down, tour buses went away, streets became empty. Uh, oh, there was a lot going on. Yeah, All right. So what I did was I wanted to sort of speak to that feeling that I got uh, of being absent um, during parts of the day when there was no, no, need, no reason to actually leave Harlem at night uh, because it was the same place. So I began to photograph a series called Harlem Nocturnal, and this is one of the key images that represents that series. This is 125th Street um, and Adam Clayton Powell, and this is the Victoria Five uh, Theater, which is now renovated into something different. Is this a continuation of the medium format work that you this were doing? Is, yes, this is still a continuation of the medium format work. Uh, what happened during this time was I transitioned from, uh, actually in the early 2000s, I transitioned from that heavy medium format to a lighter medium format camera, which allowed me a little bit more flexibility in photographing, but still kept the contemplation because it, the camera didn't weigh me down, so I would last a little bit longer. Um, and by that time, I was working a little bit more, so I had the ability to afford more film for shooting series of images. And this image represents the series that I was going, that I started to do. And from that catapulted many other um, photo series that I've begun working on in the interim. And one of the key factors in creating a series was that I wrote down every idea about every series that I ever conceived of, and it became a running uh, dial a running log. So I have a running list, and it's a never-ending list that I began in early um, twenty, in about twenty, early twenty tens, actually before that. And I started to, I'm sorry, twenty oh one, and kept the ideas as a list. So I have every idea. That way, I don't forget what I thought about in terms of photography and what the series I would like to maybe approach. Uh, to give you an idea. I figured there are about 35 to 40 series that I've thought about uh, over that period of time and m about maybe 12 that I've actually started to work on. So just think about that. There's about another 18 series that I haven't even started yet. So that's an interesting thing to conceive and think about. Okay. And here represents the 2010s to 2019s. Um, some in, in about... Uh, okay, good. I'm doing good on time. Um, in the 2010s, uh, what happened was I switched from medium format. In the middle of the decade, I switched from medium format to smaller camera. That camera allowed me to think differently about the photographs I was taking uh, and to approach photography differently in a major way. Uh, as you can see here between the other two shots and this one, it's different. They're people. I'm more engaged in the daytime. I'm more engaged with people and I'm working up close. Um, when I was using the other medium format cameras, I wouldn't work this close. Uh, and also the advent of digital allowed me the freedom to photograph as much as I wanted to and edit later. There's that, there's that mode that people say it's a shotgun thing. I don't use the shotgun mode, but I think what it does is it allows you the freedom to uh, contemplate alternate ideas within the same realm. So if I'm photographing a flower, I don't have to just photograph it from uh, restricted to the 10 shots. I can now photograph it 
in any angle I want to and not think about um, the not contemplate as much contemplate less when I'm shooting and more when I'm editing. What do you, mean? you also changed you changed format as well. Yes, as from film to the in medium from film yes. to digital. Yes. Yeah. What do you mean by shotgun? A shotgun when you're just uh, motor driving, basically motor driving, or uh, you know just bang, 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 and hoping for one to be the case instead of just you know going in photographing what do you mean the like idea. Machine gun is a machine to gun. Sniping. Yes, machine gun, if you want to call it that. So uh, and since then, um, I've been heavily engaged in the early 2000s, early 2010s in photographing people almost exclusively. Um, so if I were to balance it out, I'd say I've been photographed, when I was using medium format, I was photographing 80% um, sort of non-moving items or slow moving items where it was 20% people. Now I'm photographing 90% people, 90, maybe even 95% people uh, street and only 5% still life um, or um, buildings or architecture. So it's it's changed the dynamics of the way I photograph, and that's the progression, uh, a small progression, a small uh, part of what's growth I've taken over the last uh, thirty years. So, gentlemen, if you have any questions regarding what you saw, or anything, and, and one of the, and may I add, one of the most humble people that I know, this guy Kenneth Nelson, street photographer extraordinaire. I can see the progression. But he's got like work in the Museum of the City of New York. And he's like so humble that he doesn't even mention it. But I'm going to mention it because this guy is the real deal. You know, street photographers, anybody that doesn't respect street photographer, you know, there's, there's a place they can put their lips. This guy, Ken Nelson, tell them about your work that's in uh, the... Uh, Museum of City, New York. That's huge, Ken. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Um, well, yeah, it was a crowdsourced um, uh, approach, um, and this has to do with um, the Black Lives Matter movement. And uh, the museum had solicited images from the movement, and I've been going out uh, since the weekend after uh, George Floyd pa was killed, um, and I, because that was a major component of 2020 for me. And I said, listen, I'm a street photographer. This is a major, major thing. It is life changing. It's historic. It's historic. It's historic. And yeah. I have to be out there uh, as much as I can during a pandemic to make sure I put an eye on it from my perspective. Um, and again, and when you're out and when I'm out there, I was amazed because I had this idea that it wouldn't be covered as much as I thought it would be. But it is heavily covered. Uh, most protest marches or, or rallies are heavily covered by photographers. And at times, uh, there are more photographers than there are protesters or ralliers. Um, so it's kind of interesting to run a dynamic. And again, I've been out there when there were two photographers and hundreds and thousands of people. And I've been out there when there were 20 people protesting, but 30 photographers. So, you know, the dynamics change, but yet the movement continues. So, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. that's out there. That's out there. So now, especially not me to, to interject, but that now that they're debating in Congress about, you know, um, the protests on January 6th uh -huh. and having the nerve to compare them to the Black Lives Matter protests when they yeah. are nothing, nothing, you know, there's nothing compare, in comparison between the two. Yep. This is this historic, you know, enough is enough. You know, yeah. we're, we're tired of this, you know, just all the deaths of all these black people, you know, yeah. it's ridiculous. And I'm glad you're out there shooting, and I'm glad. And congratulations again for getting your work or you having your work um, supported and shown at the Museum of the City of New York. That's that's an awesome. I agree. My you got pleasure. it. Thank congratulations, you very much. Ken. Yep, I think uh, it's fantastic. Yep, cool. Let's move on, Mark. It's your presentation next. So you ready? Yes, I am. Okay, I'll put the first one up for you. All right. I think uh, pretty much what we've said is that uh, what we all did while we were in school and pretty much the first couple of years, when you, by the time you get to 1990, uh, I've already been doing some fashion work, but I didn't really have the skills necessary to do really serious commercial tabletop work. So after working in the darkroom for a number of years, 
I was fortunate enough to be able to get a job at the same studio that Ken was working at. And uh, thank you, Ken. And there, I actually learned lighting, a lot about lighting. And we had to build room sets and so forth. And this is a scanned 4x5 chrome, right, that uh, Ken helped me with about, uh, what, 10 years ago now? Because I wanted to have a record of it. Because it's kind of odd to walk around with just transparencies these days. Uh, people just want to see something digital. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, this was just one of the photographs that we had to actually put put together the, the little sidebar to put the hutch there. I put that it was supposed to feature the, the toaster. Uh, you had to use the, the backlighting, and then you had to use uh, all sorts of tools in order to get the reflection proper, uh, look properly uh, done. And so this represents pretty much that, that 1990 to 1999 uh, learning curve that was so important to the commercial work that I was doing. By the end of this experience, we had been using digital cameras that were very, very, very slow, and you could only use them for products. But by then, I'd gotten so uh, involved in IT work that I'd gone to Minolta. And I thought I would transfer to the, to the camera division. But if you go to the next slide, uh, I didn't get an opportunity to go to the camera division because Minolta closed its camera division. <laughs> and pretty much I was in IT for a while and didn't take any pictures for a very long time. So pretty much from about 1999 or to year 2000, right? Mm -hmm. All the way up to about 2004, I really didn't take a lot of pictures just when my wife and I went on vacation and so forth. I was very much involved with IT, got a bunch of certifications in IT work and uh, we had children. And Right after we had children, or right around the same time we had children, they started having these smartphones where you could take photographs and send them via the, the internet. And uh, basically, we lived a very suburban life in New Jersey, for in central New Jersey. And as you can see, we're here in a, you know, sort of a, a book slash CD store. I don't think people even sell that many CDs anymore. So you can tell when the kids mm -hmm. are. And this was kind of my uh you know the skill set of as a, a former student of street photography to get both kids in the same frame it's basically that same idea uh you know it's basically any street fire for worth their salt could do that's not cropped it's just the whole picture from the from the little cell phone mm -hmm. and then when you go to the next one by the time we get to 2009, I'm no longer at the copier company. They had a couple of mergers, and eventually I wasn't there anymore. And I found myself in central New Jersey, and you don't really have a lot of street work in central New Jersey. Uh, the big cities are in the north or in the south, uh, and even central, it's not really – it's not really like uh, an urban area as much as it's sort of a more condensed suburban area. So you find yourself doing a lot of, and I've mentioned this before, families, weddings, high school athletics, pretty much anything that people can't photograph for themselves. You know, ironically, you find out later that your uh, uh, a lot of your customers uh, will, you know, as the kids get older, a little bit easier to manage. Uh, they'll buy cameras themselves and then take a lot of those photos. But in the beginning, when they're toddlers, you do, do, do that. Now, this one image is really just a tear sheet from a, uh, a magazine that approached me. It was called uh, I think it was Country Woman Magazine or something like that. In any event, uh, I removed my, my phone number because it was a Jersey phone number, but the website uh, is still there. Uh, and this ran in 2011. And uh, they, I, I forgot, I think I did someone's wedding in exchange for this. And it was a full page ad, uh, looked really great. Um, I don't know if, I don't think I have the tear sheet around anymore, but I still have the, the, the information, I mean, this, uh, this file. And uh, so it was just a couple of the kids and my kids. And you can tell it's old because I actually see, say, uh, the photos uh, they will want, they will want in their wedding video, in the wedding video. And then later on, I talk about she, which mm -hmm. is really, really ancient thinking. But at the time, I was photographing a lot of weddings, and quite honestly, back then, and it doesn't seems kind of odd to say 2011 is back then, but it is. Mm -hmm. I had only been dealing primarily with the brides and the grooms would sort of tag along, but it was primarily the brides who would book the, uh, 
the the weddings and back then uh at least from where when i was working it was very rare that you had same sex couples uh who weren't really looking for uh elaborate top tier photographers i was not really the elaborate top tier photographer i was kind of in the middle mm -hmm. and i think that also represents the pageant work that I've done, you know, it kind of went from weddings to families to kids and sports and then pageantry because in New Jersey there are pageants that um, are uh, not just for uh, uh, adults who are above the age of 18, but there are a lot of pageants that allow kids as young as five, six years old, I think, all the way through to adulthood to participate uh, and they're, they're national pageants. And there's, so this kind of represents all of that kind of suburban living that I did in that time. So that's really it. And it, you just get a real sense of the type of imagery um, that was, you know, able, I was able to, 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 to make a living with. Yeah. Yeah. Not a lot, of, not a lot of magazines, you know, people were not really, and, and you know, things were migrating to the web. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, Facebook was kind of, ooh, ah, it's kind of new. People were very much involved in that. And that's it. Okay. All right. I don't have any questions for you. <laughs> yeah, I know. Very, 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 you know, very, very linear progression. It was just, you know, I, 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 you know, if you catch me in the 80s, you'll see the fashion stuff. But if you catch me in the 90s, it was really kind of learning lighting and things like that. And then if you go to in, in, in IT to transition to digital, and if you go to, you know, that that the, the 2000s, I pretty much ducked out for about half a, well, a little bit like six, seven years. And and, uh, and then by 2009, I started really doing uh, photography uh, full time again. And so it was a huge learning curve once again, because then again, I went from uh, went from 35 millimeter to four by five to cell phone to uh, 35 millimeter style camera again, uh, and and now uh, 35 millimeter and uh, medium format. It's a it's a you know it's back and forth and up and down. And I and I've even had film medium format cameras in between that, mm -hmm. you know that have come and gone. Mm -hmm. But I didn't really you know get a chance to use them. Okay. You know? So. Okay. So, all right. So uh, I guess which transition was the most difficult and which transition was the easiest? I would say the easiest was in the studio because it was actually something that I had always wanted from the time I had, uh, from the time I, I first started working with a camera in uh, high school, uh -huh. uh, I really wanted to understand everything that went into a, uh, a a professional photographic shoot that you know you use lights and studio and you know dealing with models and all that. So I would say that was the most enjoyable because by the time I got because 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 the time by the time I got to the uh, catalog studio, mm -hmm. uh, there were photographers there who were willing to teach really how to do the job, mm -hmm. which was something that you know you don't really. Uh, it wasn't really as uh, easy to get. I mean, remember back then there was no internet, so you couldn't just sort of Google anything. You know, you couldn't do a search. There was no search engines. You, you know, if you wanted, you had to go to a bookstore or you had to find a bookstore like a photographer's place on Mercer Street. Uh -huh. you, know, and you had to, you know what I mean? There were very limited places. It was all it was all hidden. I mean, I think one guy was revolutionary. What's his name? Dean Collins. When he was doing the uh, the light painting tool because he was selling this light painting tool and he was a commercial photographer and he was selling series of videos, yeah. you had to know they existed. And yeah. there were a lot of secrets. You don't really see the word secrets in relationship to photography anymore. Well, okay. Well, yeah. Well, I have. Well, we could discuss that another time because I, I'll argue that point on YouTube. Uh, everybody's oh, yeah. got a secret because that's the dynamic that gets you to look at the video. 10 secrets of something or something tips or something. Well, like, right. But, you but I mean, if life. you ever watch them, they're not really secrets. They're not, I mean? no. But, no. but back then, if someone told you like the secret of how to photograph champagne, right. Then yes. John tells us, yes. <laughs> right. You know, yes. th that yes. kind of thing, you know, that, that was a secret. People would not just yes. blurt that out. Yeah. Yeah. They, yeah, they do that. Um, yep. Leave it then. It's not a secret. But it's if, not a secret. If you, if you yeah. present it properly, 
I mean, you can say something's a secret just to pique somebody's interest. True, but, I, but I'm talking about just you know between three photographers, the truth is there are there there is one there are a couple of secrets now, and I agree with you, there are a few, uh -huh. but they're, they're not of the same nature. Now the secrets are more about how business is actually transacted, as opposed to technical uh, acuity or you know what lens is used for street photography. You know, you know one time you know you kind of had to you know know who to ask to find out a 35 millimeter lens. <laughs> lens you know made, made a wide angle you know you don't have that kind of brick wall as much anymore now they're like oh yeah you got a 35 or 28 you know people you know i use a 24 to 300 you know people were very gladly tell you how to get your image yeah yeah hey greg you're up next yes, sir. we got I'm you up. next okay mm -hmm. okay yeah. here you go yeah kenny again you did it to us you know and i'm like whoa what <laughs> From 30 years ago, from 20 years ago, from 10 years ago, and I'm like, all right. Well, uh, life-changing events, yes. Way back in the 99s, I, uh, 99, I got smart and had a, had a son, you know, and uh, life-changing event. But, um, you know, it was interesting to be able to... Uh, give somebody my fully automatic digital camera and or film camera i don't remember which probably film camera at the time and snap a snap a photograph of myself and my son oh, it's uh, quite a quite an event okay next one okay let's make sure i can do I that mean, there's no there's no i didn't really show a progression as far as technicality because uh, i mean it was yeah just like you guys it was a uh, uh, you know, the advent to work with the old uh, Kodak Bumblebee Hive uh, uh, back 2.5 megapixel uh, digital camera uh, and doing some photo photojournalism work with uh, with the Navy. And it was a big, cumbersome camera, but, you know, you had to get it done and it sped up the process, which was very cool. You can now, you know, shoot, shoot, uh, shoot an event right up your blurb and uh, fire it fired out uh, over the internet um, and have it in Washington in a matter of minutes, you know, or, you know, depending on how slow your road or a uh, few adjustments in uh, Photoshop and uh, presto change, I was across the country or around the world of photos. Okay. Uh, you know, and, uh, you know, as life goes, you know, this, uh, you know, I, <laughs> um, I have seen the bumps. Everybody's seen those bumps. You know, beware, slow down, bumps on this road. I've seen uh, out here, I came to California, and there were humps, of course. Uh, I, I kind of figured that one out. So there are uh -huh. humps in certain roads. And uh, good old Brooklyn never, 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 never disappoints. We've got rumps. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> black and white street shooting phase and uh i was this this almost made me lie on the ground and and cry because it was just so unexpected and so funny to me that uh i had to shoot it and there it is i my first picture of a rump so <laughs> um nothing particularly special about uh um you know how i was shooting i'm, I'm a big fan of just getting out there and shooting uh studio is great as for you know for uh certain things i tell you i i uh, later on i i learned um the best studio techniques from a filmmaker and how he used like maybe one or two hot lights and about 10 reflector cards and just lit up this 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 thing and i i was just totally floored by what he could do with reflector cards mm -hmm. it was wonderful so uh -huh. Um, what's next? All right, you can move on to the next one. I do like my rumps. Um, now this one, you know, it's like, you know, the further, further, oh, nice. I didn't know you could do that. Cool. Yeah. Um, you make know, it. the further forward, you know, the, the further forward you look, the further back you see, you know, so all of the, uh, digital is wonderful, but, um, depending on what you do with it. Uh, I see, you know, some photographers 
looking to you know the uh, the old masters of photography to to uh, to try to do things um, like I could really get a kick out of that guy you know just out of the blue who did the um, the people of New York series shooting the yeah. homeless people and and uh, really got some you know because people just because they're homeless you know they have stories they have lives there there was another story about this uh, this uh, I don't know if she was an A-list Hollywood actress, but uh, they they just uh, were so a shooter was out there on the street and they ran into her. And it's like what happened, you know that 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 uh, hubris, you know, mm-hmm. um, finding out how folks went from there to here. How did you get here? So similar with uh, photography, you know, um, I. <laughs> One of the reasons why I always keep a camera with me, I shoot 35. I like I like four by five. If I could go out and, uh, like you were saying, shoot some deliberate stuff, it would it would take it would take a place like, um, you know, like the Grand Canyons or or Death Valley or someplace, mm-hmm. you know, not not so frequented, to shoot that that size format again. But mm-hmm. with uh, you know with digital being able to you know match. You know, step for step, the resolutions that you can get with that. Um, I, I don't see much use for it other than the nostalgia of it mm-hmm. and the uh, the technical challenges faced when you when you shoot a, a large format like that. But um, again, I've always been a big proponent of um, it's not so much what you shoot with, it's what you shooting. And um, you know, I've been in this. I've been out here in Southern California for few years now and have you guys ever heard of a drive-through grocery store or convenience no store? nor have i seen a drive-through restaurant that just serves milk out here i know it's kind of like the burbs of of you know los angeles but they have like little stores and you can drive in and stop and the attendant will say hey what do you want you'll give you a soda you know, a pack of this, a bag of that, pay the man, and you go on your way. I was like, what the heck? <laughs> okay, yeah. So, um, and then this, you know, I, I think I had been down this street several times. But for some reason, so that, that little voice, you know, the Holy Spirit said, look up, young man. And I said, Lord, yes. And I looked up, and it was the milk bottle. You know, so Mr. Milk Bottle like that. And who has a milk? This, this, this is such a throwback, you know. I have uh, some shots up, up in Northern California of um, an Orbit car wash, which is so cool looking. But, I mean, how does this fit into anything? I don't know. But it's there. So I captured it. And uh, it is what it is. It could have been shot. You know, 30 years ago, it could probably, by the looks of it, it could have been shot like 40 or 50 years ago. So and this establishment is still functioning as a drive through milk? No, it's spill. not not necessarily. It's a, it's a drive through excuse me, drive through convenience store. Okay. And uh, milk is one of them. I mean, look at that milk bottle. That's like yeah. one of the old, old, uh, yep. old classic milk bottles, yep. you know, and, um, and fresh milk. When, when is that a selling point? <laughs> it better be fresh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Un- Unpasteurized. <laughs> yeah, straight from the cow to your home. <laughs> yeah, there you, go. there you go. Put it right in the bottle. <laughs> yeah. Do you want a cap? See, there you go. The, the only option is do you want a lid or not? <laughs> a lid or a top hat? Like, oh, well, yeah, well, that's the lid, you see. The lid is shaped like a top hat. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Do you guys remember um, the the getting milk like that and it had the cream on the top? You had to pour off the cream. I don't. I'm just I do not. Of, I do I'm, not either. I'm not not that old. Okay. I remember milk delivery trucks, but I just don't remember that part of it. I do remember paper cartons. Wow. Paper cartons. They, yeah. Well, you know, paper cartons. They sell. They sell uh, like things like oh, they sell exotic milks like oat milk and almond milk now and soy milk. And then milk is sold in regular pl- in little plastic jugs. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Like syrup there, there being green. Um, oh, it? Well, that's that's pretty much it. All I'm, I have to say is that you know the more we look forward, the more digital photography gets um, more and more advanced. You know, it's it's still going to be kind of fun to to look back and uh, you know 
what do you capture? You know, maybe every now and then, if you keep your eyes open, if you keep a camera with you, mm-hmm. you might run into Mr. Milkball. <laughs> it made my day. <laughs> That's all I got. That looks pretty tall. You don't want to run into that. Okay. You know? So now that you've had a chance to look back the last three decades, how, what do you see as your future uh, through this decade? Photographically? Me or he or both? Well, you, whoever has an answer. If you both have an answer, to, uh, Mark, you go first. Well, I, I think for me it's going to be the culmination of all the stuff that I've done, but with... Uh, in all honesty, uh, a tool where I'm not sitting around fighting with color fidelity later or, you know, saying that, you know, it doesn't have the right resolution. All, all those uh, rendering issues, uh, they're either resolved at this point already or they're either or they're resolved by me. Meaning, you know, if, if it's not focused in an area at this point, that's that's my issue. You know, it's not, oh, my lens is, it's only this and it does not, I have this, none of that. So it takes a lot of the technical excuses away. From, okay. Right. That's what, and now I just want to get to the point where the, the, where the proficiency is just really, really high. You know, I read an article, I started to read an article, I didn't finish it yet, about, um, you know, the in defense of bad photos, you know, and what you can learn from them. Uh-huh. But uh, even though digital doesn't really have that cost associated that with film. Uh-huh. I, I don't want to take advantage now at this point. I mean, you're, I'm expending energy, I'm expending thought, and I want to make sure things are done correctly always. And what I'm really happy about is now I do very little post-processing. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's less than when I was in the dark room and I would choose between grade two and a half or three in the filter pack for the black and white, you know, it's, mm-hmm. you know, I'm really kind of like, this is how it came out the camera. Mm, I think I can live with it. And then, you know, in, you know, when you get to that point, it's very, you know, that was, yes. that's the goal. Yep. Yeah. That is the goal. Mm-hmm. You know, that's the technical aesthetically. uh, I really want to, you know, kind of uh, really try to do the type of work that I want. I think I'm at that point now where I probably, I got maybe a decade or two where I can actually do the type of work I want to do. And then after that, I won't be able to, I won't be able to physically do the job. Got it. Greg, what about you? I'm going to, I'm going to take pictures until I can't breathe anymore. Uh-huh. You know, the, the technology is going to get better and better. And, and um, man, I don't know. I, I, for me, you know, if if it's perfect straight out of the camera, what's the point? Just send the camera out as a drone and let it go take pictures. You know, part of the fun for me is the post. You know, all the stuff you can do with it. You know, throw it into Photoshop and see what, uh, you know, what, what can you bring out. Sometimes, you know, working on a picture it brings out stuff that you didn't see when you shot it, you know? So there's, there's always going to be, as long as there's a sense of, of newness and exploration about photography, I'm there. I'm so there. Mm-hmm. I'm well, not sure. What was well, your question again, well, Ken? Okay. Go ahead. Good. Well, yeah, right. What, what is your, what does your future photographically look like uh, through the next, through this decade? My future photo. Okay. Well, probably, Right now, I'm, I'm building another website. I would like to uh, put together uh, more uh, video presentations of the photographs, you know, maybe set to music because I have, I got a keyboard in there. I have a lot, of, I have a lot in me that I need to get out. Uh-huh. Um, and the pictures, like, thanks to you, thanks for that, that, that uh, exercise we did a while ago about uh, putting music to stuff or putting uh, words to the images, mm-hmm. it totally changes the impact of the image. And mm-hmm. I've got like a gad scad of uh, images for, of all sorts of, you know, studio to street to, uh, you, know, ask, you know, sky photography, mm-hmm. you know, people, places, things, you know, that, that I haven't even begun to explore yet. You know, yeah. I'm going to, man, I, poof, man, I'm just... Yeah, going to keep myself limber and keep active. And I just started riding my exercise bike again. And 
I've got a lot of work to do. You know, I got to do the video presentations. I got to build a new website. I've got, uh, you know, I slowed down on shooting, you know, uh, consciously so, because. So, so Greg, so Greg, I guess, I guess for you, auto and manual or not necessarily one preferred over the other. It's whatever it takes to get the, the image that you want. I don't understand your question. Oh, well, you know, you, you were talking about how the technology is going to be always great and it's re really there. And you're talking about drones. Most drones are pretty much, I guess they're all, I don't know. I don't have a drone, but I'm presuming they're, they're 90% automatic in terms of their exposure and things like that. Well, I've always used the automatic, you know, or used the camera as a spot meter. You know, I, I will go up to, uh, you know, something and take a reading that close, you know, mm -hmm. just so I can get an idea of where, where, where it is. And uh, a lot of times um, I'll say, no, that's not what I want. I want this. And I'll throw it into manual and I'll make my own adjustments until I, till I'm satisfied with, the, with what I get. Um, if the camera can do it all for me, that, that's, um, that, that's not photography to me. You know, it's an assist. It's an aid. It does something that I can't do. But creatively, visually, thematically, you know, verbally, you know, the, in the vernacular of light, the, the camera has no idea, you know, what, what it is that I'm looking at. No, I wouldn't expect it to. Mm -hmm. And then it's not, I mean, it's not the photographer I am. And it's the creative vision that, that, that separates photographers from people with cameras. So, well, I, 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 I... I agree with you, except, you know, these days they have a lot of automated modes where the camera has a, a database of, of light values for scenes and it kind of... Of course, ever since digital cool. came out, it's been based on photographers putting input and HDR is wonderful where it gives you a variation of, of images, but uh, I didn't hear you talking about that. Um, what, I hear, what I hear about the future of photography for me is making it a more more expressive more uh, more of a inclusive um more of a shared story like you were saying ken you know because yeah. you're you're i mean i like the way you started out with a a snow covered free field and uh most stuff doesn't move in the snow just like, <laughs> right. um, unless it's a blizzard hey man he was just um, trying to chill and then the, uh, i was, I was the holding that one in Okay. The Harlem Nocturnal, you know, I like the way you step that up, and there's a lot of motion there because if you get chased, you will run. <laughs> and um, I mean, I like the streaks and everything. I, I like the Hot Harlem Nocturnal series very much. Um, and then you know, your 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 street stuff is just amazing to me. The way you capture capture them still, and then you choose to use the drag shutter, and you know, and I'm like. <laughs> Man, it's they're just so visually fun to look at. You know, there's always something that I'll I'll miss and I'll go in. Uh, it's like a. It's it's okay. There are certain people that you can look. I mean, if the field is all red, you get the idea. Oh, it's a red picture. Mm -hmm. But um, when there's so much going on, and I enjoy photographs like that, where I find myself looking at every corner. <laughs> of the image because there's usually something there you know mm -hmm. whether you intended it or not right. but a lot of times yep. you do so yep. yep so again let me ask you a question you know you started with uh an image that had no blur you went to a second image in the next uh -huh. decade as greg mentioned has uh you know the cars that blur and then the third yep. decade you went to people that blur and i noticed in a lot of the current work there's almost no blur at all on a lot of it do you find yourself in some way, <clears throat> excuse me, going back to the idea of capturing an instant in time rather than a length of time, or do you teeter back and forth between the two aesthetics when you work uh, based on the subject? There is sometimes the technology drives the aesthetic, and sometimes, most of the time, the aesthetic drives the technology. That's where it should um, yeah. Right. So basically, you know, there are times when my head is I'm thinking and I'm considering what I'm looking at. It's always based on what I'm looking at. And then am I am I able technologically able to achieve this image? 
And so, you know, the right lighting, the time of day, you know, what's happening in front of me. Can I drag the shutter successfully in a hand holding? Do I need a do I need a tripod? Right. Sometimes the intent is throughout to go that to go out there and do that. Um, for the most part, the technology to some degree drives it because uh, with the camera that I'm using, I'm always trying to photograph as wide open as possible. Uh, over the last few years, I've learned that I shouldn't do that because I have a great deal of losses. So I'm trying to now start to shoot at a medium f-stop as 5.6 or 8. Uh, that's what I'm doing lately because I get more success out of it photographically because things are betterly, I'm better able to handle focus uh, when you do that, when you don't. Uh, and I'm one of critical focus, so I don't pixel peep, but when I go in there and I look at an image at 100%, I'd like whatever, I'd like something in that image to be sharp. Uh, what did you supposedly, say? pixel peep? Yeah, when I pixel peep. Pixel peep, got it. Yeah. Okay. You know, and so lately what's been happening is um, I, I, those who don't remember the past are doomed to repeat it. So what I've been doing is I've been going back into my archive and looking at some of the images that I haven't seen in five years. And I realized all those mistakes I made. And I said, I cannot make those mistakes again. They're, no longer, they're not successful. I need to stop that. You know, and so I right. need that, to that's what I was saying earlier about how, you know, you, even though you have all this, you know, <clears throat> it's a you have a windfall of opportunities. Now you uh, now you have to be much more specific. I mean, even Dizzy yeah. Gillespie, they asked him once, you know, does, is it any easier for you now? This is a few years before he passed away. They said, is it any easier for you now to, you know, to, to blow your trumpet? And he said, no, nah, man, this thing gets more harder to blow every day. It's like, I can't work like this, you know? It's like, I'm telling myself trying to do things I haven't done before. And uh, I think the same way, it's the same for any art form. You know, particularly with uh, something like photography, it doesn't matter what genre you're working in. If you're someone who is really concerned, you're always trying to outdo yourself. You yeah. know, sometimes you try to outdo someone else. But after a while, if you're working consistently in any genre, you're really just working against your own clock. And you're just saying, you yeah. know, you know, particularly if you have repeat subjects, you know, yeah. if you're if you're working, you know, one area. Or, or one place you're saying, you know, what can I get out of this? You know, yes. what more can I get out of this? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I, I, I want, I don't want to go too far along, but I'll just, I'll close it after I make this comment, which is I, and I think people should revisit the same place that they said they'd never go back to revisit that photographic place time and time again. That's what I'm doing because, because, you don't know. It's never the same thing another day. It always changes. <laughs> okay. And I also like that you 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 engage your brain, your visual, your your visual, your eye when you're shooting. Because you're like, can I drag this? You know, uh -huh. that, that's yes. a creative yes. choice. Yes. And I love that. And as far as you know, doing yourself, there there aren't that. I won't say there aren't that many photographers, but to one better yourself takes engagement. That's all I got to say. Yeah, I got you. Okay. With that, I want to close out. I want to thank everybody for uh, tuning in to us, and I hope you've stayed this long. I hope we've engaged your interest in uh, photography in some way, shape, or form. Uh, I hope that you, uh, as viewers, begin to understand uh, that over time, your images are going to uh, become more valuable. Uh, they may not be the $100,000 image, but I think over time images become more valuable emotionally uh, and you grow over time. And I, that's what I wanted to focus on here. I wanted to show that over time things change, people grow, people mature. And I think as long as you keep uh, an idea of what you shot uh, and you can go back to that again uh, to learn from it and better yourself going forward, uh, I think that's one of the key factors in photography. Uh, never stop learning, keep growing, keep photographing. Uh, yeah, that's it. Thanks for joining us. I'm Kenneth Nelson. My friends, uh, Mark Skinner, Gregory Clayhorn. This is Photography Talk. Tune in next time and also subscribe at the, at the bottom. Post your, post your uh, where your work can be seen at the Museum of the City of New York, man. Please. Uh, yeah, well, our links are at the bottom in YouTube, so you can go right to our links at, for our, our web pages and our Instagram at the bottom of YouTube. Okay, thanks for tuning in. We'll check you later.